Yay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I don't know if you are somewhere where you're enjoying as much sun as I am in Toronto um, and as, as sunny as Nora is experiencing, experiencing in Winnipeg, but uh, I hope so. Um, we're just waiting for a few more people, um, but in the meantime, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement and uh, Nora is going to share uh, some work that she's reading right now, some books that she's reading right now. Uh, I am sitting in Tecoronto. Uh, Nora is in Winnipeg Treaty 1 territory, but I will acknowledge right now that I am on the traditional land of the Wendat Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Tecoronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on their territory. Nora. Hello. <laughs> I am so excited uh, to have you join us um, today. I'm, I, I finished the book and I've said on social media and I told you it was a heartbreaking novel. Um, I love Jolene. I love all of the characters and I'm excited to talk about that with you. But before we get into that, will you share with everybody what you are reading right now? Absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. It's really nice to see you all via Zoom. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming, at least in Winnipeg and Toronto, it's a beautiful day. So thanks for signing on to do something indoors. Um, I was just saying to Allison that I've been teaching undergrad uh, writing in English for the last couple of years. And I have uh, really had to like compartmentalize my reading. So certain times of the year I read, and then certain times of the, the year I read 80 essays by students a week. Um, but I'm two weeks out at the end of my semester. And um, the idea is that I should be reading heavily and catching up on a stack of novels that I'm really excited to read. Um, but instead I have uh, delved into a couple of poetry collections, which has been really nice. Um, I was also just saying to Allison that I find poetry really intimidating. I avoided studying it when I was um, in undergrad and doing uh, my MFA as well because I didn't want to have to write it I think I felt super intimidated um, maybe I was just reading the wrong poets and not to knock on like old dead white men but <laughs> maybe that didn't it was just intimidating the idea of like interpreting poetry let alone writing my own um, but I have really come to find different types of poetry that really appeal. So I really like um, hybrid forms. So prose poetry, if you can bring things in from like the fiction world, um, it feels less intimidating to me. If there's like an overarching story to a collection of poetry, that helps too. Um, so I'm reading two things. I'm reading When the Signals Come Home. That's by Jordan Franklin, Jordan E. Franklin. Uh, and it's published by Switchback Books. And Jordan is a poet that I met when I was uh, doing my MFA in New York. And the collection is um, arranged into playlists and it's sort of heavily about her relationship to music and her relationship to her father, which if you know me are two like big sources of inspiration for me. Um, and then I, uh, it's also about the experience of being uh, black in bed Brooklyn. Uh, and growing up in this sort of rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. So really rooted in um, like place and identity as well as like these more universal like music and family themes. So that's when the signals come home. Um, and then I'm also reading Sulphur Tongue by Rebecca Salazar. That's from McClellan and Stewart. So Salazar is um, Latinx, queer femme, Canadian poet. Uh, who I first became familiar with like on social media, which is so strange. And it's my first time reading more than just one of her poems, reading the whole collection. And it is similarly um, sort of like really universal and super specific, this um, coming of age experience of being like uh, a Latinx second generation immigrant in Canada um, and exploring issues of identity. Um, so it appeals because I'm, uh, sort of relaxing back into my reading life. Um, and then I'm also in the midst of like a full novel revision. 
So in some ways, I think it feels soothing to read poetry instead of a novel. Um, and then I also have like issues with my attention span since the pandemic. So like picking up a poetry collection, reading one or two poems feels um, like more of an accomplishment than like, than, you know, not necessarily picking up a novel and not like finishing it in a day, which my best reading days I can do. Um, yeah, so that's what I've been up to. And uh, like I said, I, I sort of save a lot of reading for the summer. So I'm hoping that I can attack that, that pile of novels too soon. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, and I forgot uh, just before everybody came on, Nora and I were talking about this. I forgot, I actually do read a lot of poetry on social media. You just reminded me that I, I do, I follow a ton of poets on, on uh, Instagram and I love when um, their poetry comes up because it's an opportunity to uh, quickly absorb some uh, uh, language. Yeah, I think it's a medium that makes sense on social media, yeah. which novels and social media maybe not as much yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how many posts you'd have to write to get 300 words out yeah. <laughs> um, I am excited to uh, listen to you read from uh, uh, how far we go and how fast uh, as I mentioned before it was an incredibly heartbreaking novel I loved all of the characters but before um, I hand it over to you to read do you mind if I share your bio with everybody thank you Nora Dector is a writer, musician, and educator who grew up in the north end of Winnipeg. She fled to Toronto and earned a BA in English and creative writing from York University, and then an MFA in creative writing and literature from Stony Brook University in Southampton, New York. Her essays and short stories have been published in various literary journals. Published by Orca Book Publishers, How Far We Go and How Fast won the 2019 Kobo Emerging Writer Award. You can find out more and hear Nora's music on her website, www.noradector.com. She currently lives in Treaty One Territory in Winnipeg. Nora. Thank you, Alison. Thank you for judging up my bio. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read um, what I call the mosh pit scene from my book. It's uh, sort of like right in the middle of the novel. And um, the book is about a um, 16 year old named Jolene, um, who is dealing with her sort of dysfunctional family and in particular the departure of her older brother who was um, sort of her like main support and one of her best friends. Um, so in the aftermath of that, she is dealing with some pretty serious teenage depression. And on this particular night in question, she gets into a fight with her mom and decides to, um, to pick up an old friend on an invitation to go to a show downtown. So um, this old friend is named Ivy and she's somebody who Jolene only knows a little bit. Um, and I think because Ivy doesn't know too much about her, she's able to kind of get over Jolene's uh, walls and her defenses. So we open with Jolene walking into um, this show. The doorbell takes my five bucks and marks the inside of my wrist with a Sharpie. She wears her hair all in her eyes, like she's so cool she doesn't need to see where she's going. I'd like to take notes on how she pulls this off, but Ivy is saying my name. Jolene, you came. She goes for the hug. I don't hug easily, but I manage to submit to it without doing anything too alienating. The band's about to go on, she says, as we enter the room. You're gonna have to elbow your way to the front. The gallery has high tin ceilings that amplify the music pounding out of the speakers not far from where we stand. I'm not going to get away with mumbling tonight. I yell okay and she shouts she'll be back in two shakes and then she's gone, fighting her way over to the folding table bar where a tall fellow seems to be going for a Jesus look immediately engages her in conversation. Tonight her pastel hair is swept up in a bird's nest knot at the back of her head like some kind of haphazard confection. She's wearing jeans and a denim jacket lined with thick fake fur, denim on denim, and it works. I shift from one foot to the other. I try to rearrange my face to mask my discomfort, but in the end, I give up and walk over to the wall, which is hung with oversized photographs of sad cityscapes. No one else seems to be here to consider the art, but I circle the room, recognizing buildings, graffiti train cars, and boarded up storefronts. I study each photo in turn, and when I'm done, Ivy still isn't back, and I can't see her anywhere. 
At a bit of a distance and to an untrained eye, these people could be homeless with their anti-hairstyles and their laundry hamper looking clothes. They don't appear to be paying attention to me, but I feel observed anyway. I could just leave. The door is right there, but I stormed out of the house not an hour ago. And the thing about storms is no one remembers the ones that just blow over. They have to rage on for a while. There you are. Ivy appears and puts a beer in my hand. Shall we do this thing? She starts towards the stage without waiting for an answer. I'm sorry in advance if this offends your sensibility, she calls over her shoulder. I haven't heard Drew's music in a while. It could be bad. In front of me, Ivy slips through the crowd, squeezing her slight frame in between the bodies of people talking in twos and threes. I struggle to fit myself through the gaps she's leaving in her wake. It turns out there's no stage, just a red and gold Persian rug on which the boys in the band are organizing themselves. A rough semicircle is formed around them, leaving space in front that suggests a dance floor. Of course, that's where Ivy takes me, into the hole in the crowd at the feet of the band, where I'm taller than everyone. I feel their resentment burning at the back of my head as the house music cuts out and the drummer counts off. They launch into it and immediately the music is so arresting, I forget to worry about how I'm obstructing sight lines. The band is a two piece, the drummer and another guy on guitar who hovers over a table spread with panels of dials and knobs I don't understand. Tattooed and spry, he hangs back from the microphone while his hands move between his guitar and these other strange instruments. I recognize a loop pedal under the table, which he steps on at intervals, building layers of spooky guitar sound and then tweaking them with the turn of a dial or by bending a string. When he opens his mouth, it's an ugly, beautiful thing. His voice is filtered through so many effects, I can't make out any words and don't need to. The drummer plays with a messy in intricacy with all kinds of abandon. The kit looks makeshift, a kick drum, a snare and a cymbal, he has the sort of thick floppy hair girls like to declare themselves jealous of and then, or to touch rather, and then declare themselves jealous of. And unlike his comrade, he appears to be uninked. I watch him watch the leak eye, waiting for the changes. The sound is quiet but large and it stills the room, commands it, makes me wanna give up making mu music because I can never play like this and go home and write a song. Ivy's trying to talk to me, but she's so much shorter than I am. I have to do a sort of half squat maneuver to get low enough for my ear to be anywhere near her mouth. What do you think? She asks. They're interesting. Maybe a little too interesting, she laughs, but I could stand here studying them forever. Abruptly, it gets loud. The crowd swells behind me and I go flying forward. Ivy catches my arm and steadies me, but it comes again and I dig my heels into the ground to keep from crashing into the band. The crowd isn't just close, it's closing in. I'm sandwiched between bodies on all sides, bodies that are jumping and shoving violently like they've just been given the cue to go ape shit. The bottle of beer barely drunk is ripped out of my hand. My hat is yanked off and tossed into the air. I try to escape, but it's impossible to do anything because staying on my feet and not getting flattened now requires all my attention. I feel hands on my back and a hard shove and anger flares in me. I ram a shoulder into the nearest chest, but there's no way to tell if I nailed the asshole because everyone is pum pummeling everyone else indifferently. That's when it hits me. It's not personal. In fact, I think it's impersonal. I stop resisting the push and the shove and in seconds, I'm bashing into bodies with the best of them. Beer sprays into the air and lands on me like cool carbonated rain. Sweat drips down and soon I'm soaked, but so is everyone. My foot finds the fallen beer bottle. I lose my grip on the ground and go down, but right away strong hands yank me underneath the arms and pull me back up. I know without needing to be told that there's a code to this, an expectation that if you're knocked down, someone will pick you up again. A moment later, a girl falls to her knees in front of me and I don't hesitate hauling her up and shoving her back into the roiling mob. In between jumps, I catch flashes of Ivy. She's standing on a speaker looking out, then she's turning around and launching herself backward out over the crowd. Hands reach up and hold her and she's passed around over our heads. As she floats my way, she starts sinking fast. I try to get close enough to catch her but only manage to put my face in the path of her falling shoulder. 
Tears flood the eye that took the hit, but I can't rub them away because Ivy gets up, grabs my arms, and we jump up and down more savagely than before. They try to tear us apart, but Ivy's hold on me is tight. Hair sticks to my face, but I don't brush it away. My calves clench and cramp, but I carry on. I take an elbow to the head and feel my brain bang into the side of my skull, but still we jump. The crowd is an organism unto itself, and I couldn't leave now if I tried. And why would I want to? So I can go stand by the wall? I don't want walls tonight. Tonight I'm in the thick of it. I let a smile unfurl on my face, close my eyes, and throw my weight around. So I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit uh, to try and keep it to a tight 15. Uh, so the, the set ends, the band goes off stage, and uh, Ivy and Jolene find each other. The party sort of spills out onto the street, and Ivy takes Jolene off on her own to show her some of um, her street art. So these paintings that Ivy has made on the side of buildings downtown. And then um, the two girls run into the boys from the band. So we pick up there. They come to a halt in front of me, their arms full of gear. Drew is looking up, but the drummer watches me emerge from behind the dumpster where I've been cowering. Hi, he says, amused. Hey, I mumble as Ivy drops to the ground beside me. Together, we back away and look up. A white bird floats in the wall two stories up where there wasn't one before. Swan, asks Drew. Albino peacock, says Ivy. I saw one at the zoo. She elbows me too hard. Pretty cool, huh? Uh-huh, I say. And try to tell her with my eyes that I want to go, but she's in no rush. Joe, this is Drew and Graham. Drew and Graham, this is Joe. You guys need a hand? And then we're continuing down the alley, around the corner and up the street to their rehearsal space where Drew fumbles for his keys before letting us in. Graham holds the door so I can go in first and in the elevator he stares at me and not in the way guys stare when they think you're pretty but in the way they stare when they think you're going to drop their expensive musical shit and break it. I hoist the amp a little higher in my arms. Maybe my muscles haven't completely melted yet. The elevator is too well lit the walls are mirrors and there's nowhere to look that doesn't make me more uncomfortable than I already am. And I am, and how. Ivy is explaining how we met, making it more than it actually was, making me more than I actually am. I have to learn how to do that. Joe and I used to be rivals in another life. She's also in a band. I shake my head. I'm not in a band. So you're a singer songwriter then, Graham asks, and it's clear that's an insult. Douche, I think, but out loud I just say gross and feel a pang of relief when everyone laughs. The doors slide open and we go down a long hall to another door where Drew can't find the keys but then does, and inside I put down the amp as super extra gingerly as I can. When I straighten up, Graham's watching again, but I'm relieved because now we can leave. Except no. Graham's, or Drew's grabbing beers from a little fridge and Ivy is saying, of course we want a drink on the roof, are you kidding? And now we're back in an elevator, going up to the roof. I hold my beer too tightly and the can crackles and I keep opening my mouth to say, I don't do roof drops and no, I'm not kidding. But every time I open it, nothing comes out. So I take a drink of beer instead. By the time the elevator opens, the can is empty. We're not there that yet though. Now it's into the stairwell and up a flight to a maintenance room where pulleys and other elevator entrails hang out in the dark. In one corner, a wooden ladder leads up to a trap door in the ceiling. Ivy goes first, pushing the door open and disappearing out onto the roof. Drew follows and then Graham. I hang back, looking up at the square of empty sky. There's no way I can't and there's no way I can. Graham's face appears in the opening. You coming? I would give anything to be cool right now and follow him up that ladder, douche or no douche. But my head, my head shakes of its own accord because my body doesn't listen to anything I tell it anymore. I'm headed for the exit when there's a thud behind me. That's cool, I'll stay down here with you. I turn around and he's settled on the floor near the base of the ladder. He nods at the space behind, beside him and I sit, careful I'm not too close, not too far away. My mom is super afraid of heights too, he says. And I feel blessed that it could be that easy. I'm afraid of heights, that's all. Hey, Ivy peers down through the hole in, in the ceiling. Come on, you guys, the view up here is crazy. Joe and I are gonna hang down here, he says. Oh, says Ivy. She looks at me, an eyebrow raised, and I look away. I look at Graham. 
He hands me his beer and I drink it. Usually people only call me Joe when they know me, but he doesn't know me, not at all, not even a little bit. And suddenly that's appealing. He's pulled out a joint and put it between his lips. He flicks a lighter alive and holds the flame to it until it's burning. While I watch him inhale, I plan out how I'll decline, when and if he offers, but then he holds it out and my hand reaches for it. Bad hand, I think, as the joint transfers between our fingers expertly. I put it between my lips, breathe in, and then I'm warm when I didn't even realize I was cold. Relaxed when I didn't realize I was holding all kinds of parts of me tightly. So what do you do, he says. I walk a lot, I say, breathing out smoke. And through the smoke, I know I've said something strange, but I'm feeling beer brave, I'm feeling weed wise, and I don't care. I don't know if I've ever not cared this much in my life. You don't drive either, he says, and I shake my head. It's a fucked up place to live without a car. I don't like cars. Same, he smiles and passes the joint back to me. And again, I plan on dec declining. And again, I accept it instead. The thing about them is they go so far, so fast, too far and too fast. You can't take things in. He nods. I like to move more slowly, he says, stretching his legs out languidly in front of him. They are long and thinner than mine by far. He looks up through the trap door to the sky and I follow. But you're a drummer, I say. You're like speedy and I lose what I was trying to say, cast around for the right words, like always in motion. But I'm also staying still, think about it. I move, but I don't go anywhere. He smiles. Anyway, I try not to be one of those drummers who's always tapping things and keeping time, he says and demonstrates, beating his knee, the ground, my arm. I find that curious. Not his hand on my arm. Well, that, but the other thing too. Do you though, keep time? Yeah, I do. I hope I do. I try to keep it to myself though. Does that make sense? It does, I say. And he looks at me and just like that, I feel too far gone, too in deep. I sit on my hands to keep them from doing anything else I haven't sanctioned. And Ivy's head appears in the trap door again. You kids behaving, she says. And when we assure her we are, she disappears. And then Graham asks me what I listen to. Here's something I know. When talking to boys about music, prepare to be talked at. But it's not like that. I don't know why I can talk to him, but I can. I do. I wonder if I could learn to keep time too. That's it. Thank you so much. I'm I'm glad that you jumped ahead and you got to that uh, that scene of them of her trying to go up to the roof and of them going up to the roof. It was it was one of my favorites, including the the nod to the title of the book. I I always love that as a writer when I read. I always look for the um, the hint at the title or the the thing that inspired the title. So I'm glad that you shared that. Um, so everybody, I have a few questions that I'm going to ask Nora. Um, uh, they're, they're generally writerly focused and uh, I'm happy at the end to open it up to you if you have any questions about the book or about Nora and writing or uh, reading in general. But for now, I was struck and again, this is probably something not every reader would think about when reading the book, but just in knowing uh, a bit of your history and, and knowing who you are. I wanted to talk about how you as a writer came to this novel, like came to the idea and how you wrote the familiar, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. And mm -hmm. that, and in, in talking about the, the stage and in describing the guitars and the music and the musicians, I loved the balance of not uh, being being educated as a reader about music, but just feeling like I was there. So I wanted to talk about the the idea coming to you and, and how you included and approached the familiar in the book. Um, well, thanks for the question. Um, I came to the book in a whole bunch of different ways. So Allison and I went to York undergrad pre writing together and I graduated when I was 25. Um, it took me uh, seven years total to finish my undergraduate degree, even though I was pursuing English and creative writing the whole time. And when I finished, there was like this, what now feeling? Um, I don't know what it's like to pursue a different kind of career. I only know what it's like to try and be a writer, but certainly for writers, there's no real blueprint 
of like, you know, you have to carve out the time and the space to write. Um, and, you know, education can help, but like really it, you make it up as you go along. So I finished, um, finished my degree and I was, you know, handling these questions of, of, yeah, how do I continue to pursue writing? I was really worried that I wouldn't keep writing if I didn't have assignments. Um, and so what I did was I decided to uh, sub up my apartment in Toronto and go back to Winnipeg for the summer. Um, and I stayed out at the family cabin, which many of you here today will be uh, familiar with, um, sort of like an hour and a half from Winnipeg. No one was using it that summer. So I had like three months without the internet to read and to write. And I took like the maximum number of books out of the library that you can. And amongst those many books, um were some young adult books and my sister who uh would have been like I don't know 14 so like in in the YA zone also lent me a couple of of books at that time and I read my intention was just to read and write widely um I don't know if you remember this Allison but what one thing that I was stuck in my head um from our York classes was um Shyam Salvadere saying that to write his first novel he moved back home to the yeah. suburbs with his parents and when I heard him say that I was like that's a fate worse than death yeah right <laughs> but then the family cabin and like um you know I, I I waitressed I was a barista in Toronto for like eight months of the year made my way that way tried to save money and then for three summers I went back to Manitoba and was writing back to my reading list is reading these YA books and really had this moment of like these aren't very good I could write one of these and um started writing Jolene yeah and so that's kind of how I found that really just like a lark like oh I could do this maybe I can I thought I can bang out a draft in the summer and then sell it and four years later I finished it right. um so that's where the YA idea came from um I had always been writing about brother sister relationships. I have um, like an older brother I'm really close to and the brother sister relationship and how far is based off that. So um, it's sort of like once I decided to write a YA book, all of these other influences just kind of got poured into that one pot. So like giving myself permission to write about what I find exciting about life, which is mosh pits and like going out to shows when I was young and um, discovering that world was really exciting. And the idea that I could put that into writing, um, giving myself permission to do that, I think it was when the book started to really like be a book. Yeah. Yeah. Were you a swimmer? I no. was. Yeah. So, well, so was I, as you probably know from the, the, how I, I feel it. So was Kaylee. Mm -hmm. Um, and I loved, uh, as I said, with that, with the familiar, not being, too familiar in that, uh, you know, teachy kind of way. I loved how swimming existed in this book as just an, uh, just an authentic part of who she is, you know, and, and uh, not too detailed and, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, your answer goes immediately uh, answers my fourth question on my list about how you came to write a YA novel because at times reading the book and of course thematically there's there are um things in this book that cross all genres right the the um loss and experience of being a teenager we all can share in in the the drama and trauma of of being a teenager um, and so did you ever think while you were writing it, because there are really and truly like grown up characters that, that exist, that, um, could exist in, in a, a adult fiction novel at any point, did you think, I wonder if I could make this an adult fiction novel? Um, definitely the whole way through, I kind of, so I explained like the impetus of trying to write a YA novel and then. And I really had this feeling of like, oh, these are, these are kind of like schlocky. I can bang one out in the summer. And then I was like, oh, but I love them. You know, like <laughs> my characters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it became, you know, something that I wanted to uh, put a lot of like sensitivity into, like to really think about who these people are and like honor their stories, if you will. Yeah. Um, my, my feeling the whole way through writing it, which like spanned, me alone in the cabin and all the way to like grad school in the States um, and then back to Toronto, I uh, was kind of like 
it's not my business what genre it is. Someone will tell me whether or not it's YA at a certain point in time. And I, um, I find the only time I write anything that's any good is when I um, sort of like trick myself into forgetting that anyone will ever read it, you know, yeah. um, let alone market it, you know. Um, so I knew it was in this could be adult fiction, could be YA zone. I love books about um, teenagers like that aren't published as YA, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, um, Lullabies for Little Criminals, A Complicated yeah. Kindness, things like that. Um, and so I decided not to care about genre. And, and I think that was important for me to like, just write the book that I wanted to write without worrying about the label. Um, right. and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the novel that I'm writing now is similar in the sense that it, the protagonist is again, a teenage girl mm -hmm. and it's again, um, written in like a close first person. Um, but this time I'm kind of like, eh, I think I'd like to publish it as adult fiction. It just it felt like a really, um, like a slight, I veered ever so slightly down the YA road, you know, like it could have gone either way. Yeah. I find, I find works of literature that are a little bit hybrid the most interesting, you know, yeah. so I combined music with this novel. So the songs that Jolene talks about writing in the book, um, my partner Nick and I recorded so you could like listen to the EP and I just think that like limiting yourself to a predetermined form often like deadens my writing yeah so yeah it's about like performing for me it's about performing like um mental like gymnastics and pretending like I'm writing this to impress myself always yeah. um, and then I find then that's when I like trick myself into being like I can just write like a a 20 page scene about a mosh pit and then something good comes out, you know? But when I, I, um, when I first started writing my new novel, I had the idea that it would be um, told from the third person with a male protagonist in his thirties and would be, we would sort of show how um, versatile I could be and you know, stretch my wings and I would write something that maybe, I think we still devalue young female voices, even fictional young female voices yeah. a little bit. Um, and I worked on the book for about a year before I realized that it was like the 30 year old male protagonist, like much younger, inappropriately younger girlfriend who I was way more interested in. She became the narrator of the book. So um, even when I think I'm letting myself write what I think I want to write, even when I'm like, eh, I'm going to bang out a, a YA book in, in three months. Yeah. Um, yeah, like other, I get drawn in different directions. So it's about kind of like, uh, continuing to examining, to examine like what I'm actually working on um, right. and, and leaving things behind if, if need be too. Yeah. yeah. And that, that voice, that, that close first person, the, the, it's written in first person present tense, which is, I, I always find a very challenging voice because it can move very quickly. Like it has this tendency to move really quickly was that a voice that immediately came when you sat down? Like, was, was that how Jolene came out when you sat down to write? I think first person present tense is like my default voice. And it is, it's like what I do well, but you can also only stretch it so far. So like, yeah. um, especially with a teenager, like limiting yourself to what they are feeling and thinking in the moment, isn't necessarily going to tell a well-balanced or nuanced story because they can't see what they're going through with any perspective always. Um, so I think another, another big, like, um, stretching my wings and like figuring out what my writing is about has been, um, uh, figuring out how to balance that really like close internal voice with, um, scenes kind of like in, there's parts of the mosh pit scene where it's like Jolene falls back a bit yeah. and this other narrative voice takes over, even though we're still in, it's filtered through her. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so first person present tense it's limiting, but I've, I've like sort of had to challenge myself to like stretch what is, what's possible, I think. Yeah. It, it works well for Jolene from, from my perspective, because she is living, um, at a distance from herself, right? Like she mm -hmm. is not necessarily living, uh, the, the truth, which can't really be shared here, but she can't, 
she can't see everything, right? So I, I, I thought it was great because it, it can sometimes, as you say, be a voice that can't uh, you know, last through, through an entire novel. Sometimes I pick first person uh, present tense novels up and I, I don't get it. Like I don't get it from the library. I don't get it from the bookstore. Um, but this, and I've read a couple of others this year that worked really well. And all three of the, the narrator, narrators in your book and the other two that I read, the, the narrators were kind of back mm -hmm. from their real, their real world, I guess. I think, yeah, I think you have to balance the intimacy and like the intensity and you can yeah. do it in different ways, like narrating a scene that's happening outside the character a little bit more or like a flashback in which like a, a more controlled or like reflective narrative voice takes over. But um, the first things that often come to me are like are written in first person present tense, like yeah. that emotional immediacy is what yeah. I get first. Yeah. Yeah. And a part of the narrative voice that I found so spectacular, again, was the balance of exposition and scene. There are moments um, where there's dialogue, but then there's this dialogue that's summarized, right? And that also adds to, um, I think, the distance that Jolene is, is um, or that Jolene is distancing herself from, from her real world. Was that a conscious choice? Can you think of, of those scenes and writing them that you consciously decided to summarize or uh, expose the dialogue? Yeah, um, I, I really like <laughs> dialogue without quotation marks, which I, I didn't really use in, in that book, but um, the idea that like, just by taking away quotation marks kind of raises the, the the question of how um, how verbatim the dialogue actually is. So like yeah. these subtle ways that you can raise the reader's awareness that um, the narrator is like a little bit shady in different ways. And I think I find that really interesting about human psychology in general, like the ways that we are aware of ourselves and then also fooling ourselves at any given moment. So putting that on the page, I think is- Yeah, yeah no, I, I really love that. Um, we and you talked about uh, your characters at, at the the beginning before you started reading. And again, as I said, with the the reality and all of the things that are real in this book, I felt like these characters, like Maggie, Ivy, Earl at the pawn shop, and even the lady at the bus terminal, like even though they weren't real characters that that. Uh, had a played a big part in the storyline they were characters that were so real so funny I mean the relationship between her and Earl in the pawn shop and even the <laughs> the relationship she has with the lady at the bus terminal um mm -hmm. it was so great and and I I have as a reader a tendency to think I wonder if these people are based on real people I wonder if if these characters are based on on real people um, you don't necessarily have to answer that, but I wanted to talk about how you fill this novel with characters that regardless of how small they, a part they played, they were big. They said big things about Jolene. You know, the, her talking to the bus, the, the woman at the bus terminal said so much about, about her experience and what she was going through. So I just wanted to talk about how you placed them in the in the book and what your thoughts were in uh, developing Jolene as a character with with their help. Um, well, I'm glad that the secondary and I don't know third wrong characters come yeah. through. <laughs> uh, I have always noticed people. I think most writers do. I'm like a nosy person. Um, I've like worked in service industry jobs for a really long time. So like um, there just becomes a shorthand for like, uh, you know, this person who comes in and orders that thing. And, and so like noticing people I think is inherent to me. Um, we live on like a pretty busy street in Winnipeg and I've been the woman in the window for the last year. And so I'll say to my partner like, oh, the tall man's walking by. And he'll be like, what are you talking about? And it's this really tall guy who walks by this time of day. Um, I, I put Jolene through a lot in the book. She's like pretty miserable. And so I think she has to have people around her who um, 
are a little bit kind, who, who see, see her, but then also sometimes she sees them. I think that's nice. Like she's probably more interested in the woman at the bus stop than the woman at the bus stop is interested in her or the bus station. Um, she's so lonely and she has so little interaction with people that like I felt um, having her like observe the guy at the pawn shop or the woman at the bus station or her mom's friends or the people who hang out at the bar that she works at uh, made her less lonely. She really doesn't have any particularly any friends at high school. So like to make that seem less, um, less like market to populate her world with these other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I always think that like, if somebody made me draw a diagram of like what's true and what's a lie in my books and like what's taken from me and, and what isn't, they wouldn't believe me. So like, you know, um, Maggie is the super messy uh, mom figure and she's like a combination of, um, you know, a girl I was friends with in high school and, and her mom who like danced in a see-through dress at our high school to graduation and like Courtney Love and um, and yeah. like pop culture people. But then there's like, you know, there's bits of me in, in various of the pe people. Obviously um, Jolene resembles me in some ways. She's tall and she is shy and she uh, used to be a swimmer, but in other ways, like she's totally different from me. Um, the brother almost, I gave more of myself to him in some ways. Um, yeah, so I think it's like curiosity about what's around you. It's making sure that the, again, balancing the like being all in the character's head with yeah. other things. And in particular, I think I needed her, she doesn't interact with that many people for swaths of the book. So giving her people to observe and um, she has these like one-sided relationships with them. I felt mm -hmm. like that rounded her day out in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And that, again, it, it's because she's just not showing up to life, right? Like she's not showing up to, um, to living her life. And uh, I love that, you know, when, when she does show up at school, it is for Miss um, Groves. Is that her name? Ms. Groves? Yeah. That, uh, like, she, it's almost like that's the only reason she's there is, mm -hmm. is that uh, she needs her kind of therapy session or whatever with that teacher who was so spectacular. I loved her so much. I, I wish that every teenager could have a, a teacher who cares that much. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about what you're working on now, but I'm wondering, Kaylee, if we should save that um, for the end. And Nora, do you want to answer questions from other people? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have a, a question from Kate, and Kate says, the relationship between Joe and Howell sticks with me the most as a dog lover, and would love to ask what inspired that relationship. Hi, Kate. Um, I think, so another thing I wanted to put in to the book was, like, in terms of Jolene being, like, a really lonely and um, depressed character, was, like, the blurring of the lines between reality and imagination. So she has um, these sort of imaginary two-sided conversations with her dog. Um, and again, I think it's a way to make her not so lonely. So how do you have, how do you have a teenage character who is like really adept at isolating herself? Like I really admire um, the extremes of teenage depression. Like I have tons of uh, empathy for it and I don't wish it on anyone, but the, um, yeah, the, the, the lengths that a depressed teen can go to, to not talk to anyone or to avoid social interaction are, are great. So I wanted to give her that. Um, but I still wanted, I wanted her to have, um, like enough support, but not too much support. In an early draft of the book, an editor told me she has too many helpers. So I had to kind of like trim away. I trimmed away like one or two helpers and left her with like, oh, she has an English teacher looking out for her. And mm -hmm. um, and the other big support is, is her dog. Um, yeah, so it was about giving her uh, an outlet and um, somebody who wasn't one of her parents who was taking care of her. So that ended up being the dog, yeah. Yeah, I, I felt like, um, again, going back to the first person present uh, narrative voice, I found the conversation she had with Howell um, 
those those that different perspective right that kind of outside if it if it were third person limited to jolene for example we could have uh everything that howell said to her included in the book so i i thought it was a great um tool or or device i guess to allow a, a more uh whole perspective mm. in certain scenes it was it was good yeah i don't know that i even realized that that it was serving that function but but i absolutely like um even just like giving voice to the uh the sort of like wiser side of, of yeah. you know yeah yeah and dogs are better than humans anyway so every Every book should have a dog. I Every past teenager should have a talking dog. Talk. Talking dog. <laughs> yeah. Kaylee, any more questions? Yep, we have a question from Anne. And Anne asks, as a reader, I began to see Jolene's mother's boyfriend as a good guy well before Jolene did. How did you approach writing that? Oh, hi, Anne. Um, I think um, if there was a if there was a lesson in the book, if the book was an after school special, it would be um, uh, about like <laughs> this is terrible, like accepting the love you think you don't deserve or um, something to, of that nature. So Jolene is suffering, um, she's grieving, and she's also just going through like depression in general. Um, so I wanted to be able to show. I wanted to again show like the difference between how she perceives the people around her and her support system and, and who they actually are. Um, yeah, so just showing a gap between her perception and, and the perception of the people around her sort of in a few key places and hoping that the reader would pick up on that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the sort of like breakthrough that, that comes at the end of the book without giving away the end of the book is that she realizes that like, um, the pain that she's in isn't like being inflicted on her by her family that they can actually help her a lot so that was like the end goal and then it was just about you know you plant a few hints along the way and you hope that the reader picks up on them <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's such a nice way to approach um understanding depression mm. right yeah yeah yeah. The, world. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and I, and I, again, you know, it's, and, and it's, uh, it, it's not even a, a, a trope to me because it's, uh, it's so real that uh, teenage girls judge their mothers so harshly. And mm -hmm. I loved that this guy, this, this seemingly perfect guy, who I'm sure is not perfect, came along and is madly in love with Maggie. And I, I loved that, right? And, and it, it showed Jolene that her mother is in fact a lovable person and, um, you know, not, not as bad as, mm -hmm. as she thinks she is. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So I'm excited to hear about this novel that you are going to, uh, finish and share with us. <laughs> I'm finishing in time. Um, yeah. So I'm at least the, my current delusion is that I'm almost done my new novel, um, mm -hmm. that, that could fall through soon, but, um, yeah, I'm ostensibly like four years into this new book and like I said it it transformed a couple years in from uh, being told from the perspective of this 30 year old drug addict to being told from the perspective of his teenage girlfriend mm -hmm. um and uh so it's about uh it's set in a fictional town in Manitoba which I had a lot of fun inventing um everything's spread out here so I basically just smushed a bunch of things together and made up my own town and it is a place where um the opiate fentanyl has recently kind of infiltrated all of the, the drug supply. Mm -hmm. And um, my narrator is 15 year old Bria and uh, her family is impacted by um, this like drug fentanyl in various ways. Her dad is a drug dealer. And when the book opens, he's gone missing. Um, Bria, I almost said Jolene, Bria's stepmother has overdosed. She survives, but Bria is living in the aftermath of that, living with one of her aunts. Um, very inspired by my own aunts, several of whom are here today. <laughs> and uh, um, so fentanyl story, uh, it's about um, a young girl dealing with addiction and uh, in particular also uh, a relationship with this much older guy. So power dynamics, um, things that we inherit from our families. Um, there's like some weird 
environmental stuff going on to yeah. with like climate change and just like a sense of unease in general. Yeah, that's great. I love that you created your own, your own town. That's so fun. <laughs> yeah. There's very little research involved, you know, no Google mapping and trying to figure out if the street that you thought was there 10 years ago is still there. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I was like, nobody can tell me I'm wrong about geography. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, I don't think there are any other questions. Kaylee? No, no. Nora, thank you so much. I'm excited uh, for you in this next book. Uh, thanks for sharing parts of how um, far, I don't know how fast. So many words. Are we going how fast? I'm like, <laughs> you know what you'd like question yourself? Am I going to say this wrong? Am I going to say this right? Um, and Orca Publishers has given me two copies of the book that we are going to raffle off. Now, many of you I'm sure have either read the book or you've had access to a copy. So if you win, feel free to send me an email nominating somebody else, as long as you have their mailing address. I need their mailing address. Um, and Orca uh, Books will send that uh, winning copy to whomever you nominate. Uh, and so Kaylee, we'll nominate the first copy. So the first copy is going to Rebecca Dector. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so Rebecca, if you can send me an email to junctionwrites, W-R-I-T-E-S at gmail.com. Um, feel if you want the copy and you want to send it out yourself, you can do that. Um, or you can email me the person who you would like to send the, the copy of the book to. Uh, and that way you save on the postage. I think postage is about $10 for a book right now. Um, so uh, sending me the mailing address of, of the person would be great. And the next winner, Kelly. All right. And the second winner is Nicholas Lefebvre. <laughs> Full disclosure, my mother and my partner. Right. <laughs> but I'm sure I'm sure both um, will have a good idea of who to pass off the book to. Yeah. And so, um, Nora, you can give Nick my uh, email address and he can send somebody, uh, send a name and mailing address and Orca will, will send it out to whomever the winner is. Amazing. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we're back. We've only got two more readings left of the Junction Read season. Uh, on May 30th, Julia Zarankin comes with her book, uh, The Unintentional Birder. It's a, a memoir about uh, becoming a bird lover, becoming a bird watcher. Um, and then we'll finish the season on June 16th with Daryl J. McLeod and his uh, second memoir. Nora, thank you. Thank you again. So lovely to see you. Yeah, and the video will be up on YouTube uh, in the next few hours and the link will be shared on social media and I'll share it with Nora. Uh, if anybody wants to share it with friends and family, uh, they can uh, see this interview and reading with Nora. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks, bye. Thanks, Thank Kaylee. you. <laughs> Have a great night. <laughs>